Yo, what's good? Welcome back to another sit down with Scriv. With me, Scriv. Today's guest is Geo. She is a Rainbow Six Siege uh, color commentator, but content creator, a bit of streaming on the side as well. These are all kind of things that we get into. Really, really enjoyed how this one went. I, I think the um, change between, you know, me asking more direct questions and sticking to that, and then also getting involved in the conversation a little bit myself when we, you know, compare ecosystems between Rainbow Six and CS, for example, that kind of thing. Uh, I think, for me, I feel really good about reining that in and, and making sure that it's still you know, the, the the right energy that I'm looking for, that we have that conversation going on, but it's still an interview, doesn't fully go into podcast mode. In this episode, we get into some of the, uh, you know, reasons, of course, as always, for getting into commentary, some of the, the inspiration, the drive behind that, but then also touching on something that I think is uh, relatively important, and, and that's the idea of burnout. Um, I, I quite enjoyed that little conversation that we had around that, because she is a very, very driven person. And that is, I think, just evidently obvious from the the work that she puts out, but also the approach and some of the opinions and things like that, that she's uh, uh, tweeted out, for example, right, which is where I um, get all of her social media uh, input. And uh, I wanted to bring it up. And I think she gives a really, really strong answer. Um, I have also for this one, I've started to keep track during the interviews now, uh, so that we can get clean timestamps. Um, so if you want to skip straight to that, should hopefully be a little bit down below uh, to get you to that. But of course, enough from me. Without further ado, let's get into the interview. All right, welcome back everybody to another sit down with Scriv. Of course, another interview today. I am joined by uh, Geo. Thank you very much for coming on, Geo. You're welcome. Yeah, indeed. So um, as I ask all my guests, I think um, certainly... You know, I've had some people on that have uh, a, a bit of a smaller profile than yourself, right? So sometimes it helps the guests to to know where they come from. But I think it's still kind of interesting to get your perspective on what you would say is like your your brief history in esports, how you got started. My brief history. Um, I mean, I've told this story a couple of times before, but I'll try and TLDR it. But mm. uh, I was at university. I was in my third year of university. I was meant to be doing a four year degree and getting a master's on top of that. Um, and I had a really big medical scare in my third year of university. And this was the same year that I was really getting into watching esports. I'd wanted to be in esports or be involved in esports for a long time because I had a lot of friends who were into it. Uh, but they were into like MOBAs and things like that, which wasn't really my thing. So I didn't have my real in Induction until the very beginning of 2018 um, I had this huge medical scare and basically off the back of that um, I was like you know what I want to quit out of university I want to quit out of my internship which uh, if you've ever tried to apply for an internship in finance or consulting like you'll know how hard it is to get them I was like I want to quit out of all of it and I'm just gonna YOLO it and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go into esports I had no experience in esports um I had some experience in front of a camera because I'd done YouTube for years um and I was just like yeah I'm just gonna do it and so that's kind of what I did like I I quit university luckily the medical scare didn't turn out to be as as bad as I thought that it was gonna be um and my yeah my dad was like I will um pay for you to to have basically six months where you don't need to work so that you can try and make this work for yourself so i had a buffer of time and in that time i've managed to make it work <laughs> it's um kind of interesting you mentioned like a little bit of like a a, a, a buffer of time indeed but would you say because i think we'll move into this as well uh, uh, about work ethic and things like that but would you say being on that kind of timer to deliver in a sense um so that you could I guess, look after yourself, right, and, and whatnot. Um, is that something that you would say gave you a real uh, uh, fire under you to begin with and, and get things kickstarted straight away? Because I would say, like, when I got started um, casting in university, there maybe wasn't as much pressure to kind of make it within a time. If it, you know, works out, if it starts going well, great, then I'll certainly start focusing. But if it doesn't, I've got my degree, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so would you say that that sort of uh, uh, time scale, as it were, helped you in a sense um no actually if i'm totally honest and and the reason being is that i i would say 100 percent of my drive came from the fact that i just wanted to do it and that's not to say that that in your instance you didn't want to do it but right, right, right. for me i wasn't i wasn't concerned like for me there wasn't really consideration that it wasn't going to work out 
like w for whatever stupid cocky reason i i was like no this is what i'm good at like i'm gonna be fine um so i wasn't concerned about the time frame and and kind of similar to what you just said i knew that if uh, if the time did run out and i hadn't gotten anywhere then you know i had just completed a degree in theoretical physics like i was not unemployable um i had however much money in savings like i wasn't worried um so you know it for me, I just saw it as an opportunity and I was like, right, I am just going to focus on what I want to do. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to worry about how much time is left or anything like that. And I didn't. So, uh, no, I wouldn't actually say that it had any any impact on on how I approached it and my drive in approaching it. Mm. Yeah, it's it's certainly an interesting one. I've touched on it a little bit like before um, from my perspective of like a uh, a, a fear of failure in a sense right and then my excuse behind that has been like um if i don't full send as they say these days right like <laughs> the that's kids say. yeah that's uh that's my excuse do you know what i mean it's like i didn't yeah. quite make it because i've not put my all in so finding mm -hmm. that um personally and having to 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 get the drive and really really focus down and kind of be like okay um sort the degree and then after that you know this becomes the the focus and and yeah no more excuse kind of thing um would you say like that mentality of success of kind of you know uh, manifesting your beliefs and things like that you know there's obviously a lot of self-help books out there that also talk about how effective it is but would you say that that's something that from the get-go having that drive for success and and um you you could call it cockiness but i think certainly like you know your your mindset of um your belief of your ability right as has helped you to spur forwards in in quite a short space of time i think you know the the interview that you did with thorin certainly that was uh, a a big part of it was you know how quickly the rise had kind of come in a sense right um yeah. would you say that that mindset from the get-go is what facilitated that yeah i mean if i'm brutally honest i think one of the biggest things i had going for me in that regard is the fact that I, i've never suffered from imposter syndrome and a lot of people who I know who have, uh, they have, you know, reasons that span back however many years that that go into that. And it's made me feel very grateful for the fact that, uh, you know, while I was going through school and when I was a kid, there wasn't anything that injected that kind of mindset or doubt into me. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I never really had any doubt that it was going to work out and I don't I'm not even sure why I just I just was like no I'm going to make it work and I've I've always felt that about every single ambition I've ever had um it's not just something that was unique to to this and that definitely did help because it meant that I felt like I had a strong intuition for what I should be doing why I should be doing it and how I should be doing it and I felt like that put me ahead um and having that kind of attitude and that belief in myself meant that i could focus solely on on those intuitive uh decisions that i was making to try and forward my career without having something in the back of my head being like oh what if this is the wrong decision what if this is like bad oh you're not good enough and there were certainly certain things or opportunities that would arise where i would kind of question myself and be like, what is the right decision to make in this instance? But as a holistic thing, no, that wasn't a problem. And I think that that did facilitate the way that I approached things because it meant I didn't really have those stumbling blocks or those hurdles mentally in my way um, to stop me from kind of focusing on and doing what I wanted to do. So how did that um, being sure of your, your, your path as it were and, and the decisions that you're making, how did that come into play when uh transitioning from from overwatch to rainbow six it's a good question because transitioning from overwatch was something i thought about for a really long time and um you know i think this might be the first time i've kind of on a public platform spoken about this but i had i had known for a while that for me being in overwatch was quite a, a toxic environment and it had nothing to do with with overwatch as a game or the people in overwatch but it was about the way that i was putting pressure on myself and the attitude that i had and and i always did have this attitude that was um you know if you if you haven't made it in a really short amount of time then then it's because you're not good enough and i and i would kind of beat myself up because i'd be like but i feel like i am good enough and I, I've kind of later on looked back and learned and seen it through more like mature lens that actually, you know, 
there are certain things you don't have control over in terms of where opportunities come from. And that's not necessarily a comment on how good you are or how worthy you are. But one of the problems was, and and um, and I know that it's okay for me to mention this and I won't go into a ton of detail, but you know, I like I was in a relationship with someone who was much further along than me in the same game as me, um, which at that time in my life turned out to, I, I didn't acknowledge it at the time, but I, I think that had kind of a negative impact on some of my mentality um about it uh which is something that that i don't think these days would be as much of an effect on me but at the time it certainly was and um so for me i had this this huge conflict mentally where i was so passionate about overwatch i wanted to be there but there were negative things for me like mentally that were affecting me that over time I came to acknowledge and accept more and more now I had interest in other games like I got really into Call of Duty and I'd I had first considered being involved in Siege back in 2018 so I was already a big fan of Rainbow Six I had a decent number of friends in Rainbow Six and for me um the issue was not figuring out which game I wanted to go in it wasn't it wasn't accepting in my head that I wanted to go elsewhere it was accepting in my head that I was closing the door behind me that was the thing it was like the idea that like okay I'm finally taking the step from overwatch it wasn't the concern wasn't oh I'm taking a step towards somewhere else it was taking a step away from overwatch and uh, I think like the end of 2019 really signified for me like when I finally, finally like finished the last vestiges of that process <laughs> of moving on um, and being like, right, yeah, I'm I'm moving on to like greener pastures and, and, and a, a better place for me. And um, so, yeah, even though I was confident in my ability and, and that really drove my um, ethic and stuff like that when I was kind of rising up and 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 the sort of the first portion of my career um it didn't mean that making that decision to transition wasn't a difficult one because it definitely was <laughs> yeah I, I think uh i've i've given it a little bit of thought into opportunities that kind of come up and things like that it, it certainly um is rough because i want to give cs my all but sometimes there is also that you know this other title or whatever is is fresh there's not as much competition going on that that kind of things can certainly um draw you away is is maybe because from an outside perspective um would you say it's like harder to succeed as a commentator in a sense in overwatch because i feel moving into rainbow six there's a bit more of a defined kind of uh, uh growth to the top ubisoft you know um pay a lot more attention it seems and and have a much heavier hand in like talent decisions and whatnot um whereas in in overwatch i don't know i i guess it's like the contenders scene but for me it still feels like it's it's pretty oversaturated and and it's hard to um move up the rungs of the ladder so to speak I think a lot of people oversim oversimplify it and say it's because, you know, this publisher or this tournament organizer pays more attention to this or this or this. I don't think it's that at all. I, in no universe can you argue that the Activision Blizzard don't pay attention to what happens in the lower tiers of Overwatch. The sole difference is that Overwatch is a completely franchise system. And so the route in is extremely linear. In other games, CS is a really good example because it's the entire opposite of that. It is not franchised in the slightest. Um, if you don't get, let's say, um, IEM, right? If you don't get IEM, there is another tier one event that you could, in theory, get. There are many branches and many different directions, and you could end up going and working on Flashpoint or ESL Pro League or doing a Blast Pro event or whatever. In Overwatch, it isn't that way. In Overwatch, you have the Overwatch League and nothing else laterally. That is the only one in its tier. Down below, Contenders is the next one. It's the same thing. So whereas in certain other games, you can be a talent and see lots of different paths and different routes um, into various parts of the eSport, Overwatch isn't like that. Overwatch is 100% linear. And what that means is if there is not a spot above you, you don't have any wiggle room to go a different route. You you are just below them until an opportunity arises for you to move up. And you don't know when that opportunity will be. It will either be when they make expansions above you or when people quit above you. And relying on either of those two things um, is 
quite a risk because they don't happen very often. Um, so it's nothing to do with, you know, because I'm very like intimately uh, aware of, um, or at least in 20, 18 and 19 how the contender scene worked and 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 some of the internal aspects of that and and to say that they don't care about developing their talent or don't look at it in the same way uh, i think is entirely wrong it is literally just a byproduct of the way the system works and so you know siege was kind of interesting the time in which i got into siege um, I kind of narrowly got through the door because Siege is this sort of semi-franchise system now. So you have a similar thing these days where if you are not casting one of the big four regions at tier one, there isn't really somewhere else for you to go. Like Siege is almost reminiscent of how the League of Legends um, system and, and uh, like format is. Um, so like beforehand siege would have things like there'll be dream hacks and stuff like that and and feasibly if you were uh, a tier two caster or whatever like maybe you'd be invited to cast those but those don't exist anymore they don't have miners in siege anymore so siege is sort of that middle ground between the very linear overwatch franchise system and the more open csgo system and it is entirely down to what the system of an esport is to determine the kind of movement and flow of talent for the most part than it is whether tos care or don't care because i think it is it is quite naive to claim that that is uh, a factor are you um more of a fan of one than the other not necessarily like from a talent perspective but just like a general opinion on open system versus franchise system um, I can see the benefits of both. I'm not really someone who watches CSGO, so it's not like I'm really involved or, or um, you know, a, f a fan of any esport that is in that more open system because I would say the three big esports that I've been a fan of over the years have been Overwatch, Call of Duty and Siege, um, none of which have, have ever been that open. Um, I can see how it's fun but in terms of like realistically and pragmatically and logistically, I don't think it's it's remaining beneficial to have that kind of system anymore. I think moving towards a franchise system is better. And a lot of people don't like franchise systems. Um, and I totally understand a lot of the complaints that people have. And I think fully franchise systems are definitely um, quite spooky for a lot of people in various parts of the ecosystem because they cost so much money and what siege and, and league of legends have is they still have a promotion relegation system um but it's kind of like that semi-franchise sort of thing in siege you know you have like we have what's called the r6 share program it used to be called the pilot program where um you know there are certain rules that an, uh, an organization has to be paying a certain amount of money to their players or i don't think the actual rules of it are public i certainly don't know them <laughs> if they are public but it's it's all kind of stuff like that so it, it's a system that incentivizes organizations to be paying a certain amount of money and if you want to be in tier one you can't be orgless um so and there are pros and cons to the fact that it's a promotion relegation system, but if you get promoted, you have to have an org. There, are, You can see where there would be good things and bad things about that. And obviously, because it, it, it started off relatively grassroots, um, there are certainly people who have been around for a really long time who are not a huge fan of the fact that orgs own spots as opposed to players owning spots. Personally, I'm in favor of organizations owning spots as long as you have provisional clauses in contracts that mean that um, you know players can't get fucked over um which for the most part that is how it is because it's you know run by professionals you know what they're doing um so i would say i'm more in favor of a franchise-esque model moving towards franchising at a more organic pace than maybe overwatch did um because i think to sustain the ecosystem and to actually keep esports going you can't keep having the open systems that provide no security or little to no security csgo is very lucky that it's such a huge esport and can kind of get away with that um but i think not even looking at it as a talent 
Um, but looking at it as someone who is invested in the growth of esports and the longevity of it, I think that moving towards the more franchise business focused model is the only way that you can really make it a sustainable uh, ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think coming from the more open system, like um, definitely resonates talking about contracts there and things like that. There, there are certainly areas that um, without, I guess, a, a an overseer kind of thing, there are some players that do get a little bit screwed in CS from uh, dodgy contract dealings or, mm -hmm. you know, um, certainly maybe a bit of due diligence on reading and through then the thing. And you get CSPPA but, you know. drama. <laughs> yes, well, you know. <laughs> That's its uh, that's its own video, I think for sure. Yeah, yeah like, I'm sure. There's, there's a lot of it, um, but things things like that can certainly be a bit difficult when you know they feel they have to uh, uh, pick up the mantle themselves, and perhaps yes, indeed, you know what you want and what the collective of the players want or whatever. But like, how do you go about that reasonably? How do you yeah. go about that um, thinking about other parties involved, such as organizers, you know, tournament organizers and whatnot? Well, this is the thing. Like, I think that when you look at player perspectives, a lot of them are very geared towards the non-franchise system and players owning spots and stuff like that. Because for most players, they just want to compete. Like, they don't care about all the other stuff. But I think there has to be an acknowledgement of the fact that if you want to compete, you have to understand what the ecosystem that you're involved in is. And ultimately, esports is just a big marketing ploy. <laughs> like, like when you look at it, that's what esports is. It is a business. And so you have to understand that while you just want to compete, the system that you are in needs to survive in order for that to even be facilitated in any way, um, which means there has to be compromises on what is the ultimate ideal for the players, which sure, that would be no like big money involved and no businesses and whatever. But if you want this to be your full-time job and you want it to be a sustainable ecosystem like those are the things that have to be involved so that's where you get kind of the conflict of opinion i think yeah and i mean there, there often is right and um you mentioned flashpoint earlier that's one that's trying to more organically bring in a little bit of that that franchise model um yeah. for sure to give a bit back to the teams and the players and and whatnot so it is i think on its way um but for sure valve are not a big fan in cs particularly of you know uh, uh or well dota for that matter as well of one organizer r ruling everything um yeah. so which I, I i don't know i feel like it, it does kind of make sense to me but um at the same oh, time sure. they're so hands-off that maybe it would be nice if there was a bit of a, a ruling body in a way yeah yeah i um i think that's I, you know, you can kind of see it because there, there have been, you know, examples of, of publishers who have been kind of hands off. And then as the esports started to grow and make more money, they've wanted more control and they've wanted to have more power in the situation. And obviously you contract out tournament organizers and stuff like that. Uh, and that's why a lot of people, or at least I've, I've seen, um, get concerned about uh, how certain tournament organizers may um operate in the future because we are past the era in esports where tournament organizers have all the power because the publishers actually want to be more involved and more hands-on um and because it's their um ip you know and this is this is something people often complain about when they compare things to traditional sports um but traditional sports you know the concept of football is not owned by a company uh the concept of basketball is not owned by a company but the concept of CSGO or Rainbow Six Siege or Overwatch, those are owned by companies. Companies, It is their intellectual property, right? So they have the rights to do with those games and esports, whatever they want. Um, and when they are profitable and uh, the reputation of those companies are also on the line, depending on what happens, of course they want to have a more hands-on approach. Um, and that's kind of just the natural way it's going to go and has gone um i you know knowing about kind of the philosophy of valve and 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 how they see it i i can see them sort of leaving it as a as an open market so to speak i don't think that's a bad thing but there are definitely people out there who get frustrated with how hands-off valve is because they're not going to play judge jury and executioner they are going to say well right you guys can all kind of have free reign uh but that doesn't mean we're going to come in and fix all your problems for you when things go wrong. And and you definitely see people get frustrated about that because there's no one right answer on how to do it. Yeah, I, I can certainly agree. I think sometimes, obviously, um, 
in in CS, I can comment more. I don't really follow Dota at all, so I'm not really sure um, no, <laughs> whether they kind of every now and then come in and that kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to you know like decisions, we've had uh, the the coaching scandal, right? And they very recently, yeah. um, not even like a week ago, came out with with a bit of an update on that that during the uh, RMR v- events and the major, right? The RMR being the lead up to that kind of thing. Um, they're removing a lot of the the points and everything if you had a coach that indeed was involved in the scandal and oftentimes a lot of people come out and say that you know this is a bit too heavy-handed and then you have weird scenarios where um other organizers for example at the moment blast to you know they're the next big uh, event coming up in in about a week's time um they've said that they're going to allow coaches you know in in uh, a similar strain to before oh, I saw this. right and yeah. and so there's this kind of back and forth and then you have teams uh at the you know big event like blast which i think is matching if not beating the prize pool of the majors these days um so do you give more focus to that but then the majors you got like stickers you know uh, and you got uh obviously the pre- prestige of it so it, it can be a little bit confusing when there's um multiple different versions multiple different ways of going around and i think that's what esic yeah are trying to stand in and, and trying to do um but then you know it seems valve come out with this decision sort of on their own and, and not necessarily consulting i guess ESIC are still building their profile in that sense but all the same it, there's a lot of kind of crossed wires that can go mm-hmm. on i think yeah yeah it gets very political and i think that's uh you know one of the reasons why to certain uh, publishers it becomes attractive to to have a lot of that kind of the ultimate control and i mean i i know that one of the um i think one of the kind of reasons um or sort of enticing uh things about uh the format change that siege underwent starting 2020 um was that it was quite uniform so it was like every region and every part of the ecosystem is operating under this same thing so you kind of mentioned how blast is this huge event and it's got this massive prize pool which makes it compete with the majors but because they're majors they have different prestige so in rainbow six you know they've done this thing where it's like right here is the the regular season format for every region here is how majors work and this is universal across the globe a major means this si which is the biggest tournament in in rainbow six means this you win si you're the world champion there is no other event that is going to be competing with that or um you know trying to to be bigger than that there will be no other siege event in the year that is bigger than that you have your majors we don't have minors anymore but here are other events that happen and what they mean and in every single region you qualify for this it means this you win this it means this and so it's like that uniform thing which not only is probably easier for the people who have to organize it all but it's it's also probably quite inviting for uh new or prospective viewers and fans who don't want to come in and be put off by how overcomplicated the system is and as an outsider you know correct me if i'm wrong as an outsider the way the cs go ecosystem looks like is is kind of like that i get this vibe where you know i don't play cs it's quite overwhelming because there's all these different things happening. Every single tournament organizer has their different rules and their different events and stuff like that. CSGO definitely feels almost like, I don't want to say an old boys club because it doesn't feel quite that bad, but because the game is so old and a lot of the people who've been playing it are diehard fans who have been playing it for years, uh, they're people who automatically understand what's happening because they've been around for so long. Whereas, and and CSGO probably isn't that concerned about how its metrics of gaining new viewership because Valve doesn't need it. And uh, again, they've kind of let this open market of esports happen for CSGO because they understand there's a demand for it, but it's not something that they are focused on. It's not something they necessarily really deeply care about. Whereas for other tournament organizers, you know, they have a lot more of a close relationship with why they are running an esport in the first place. So, you know, for me, as someone who doesn't know much about CSGO, yeah, like the the ecosystem's kind of overwhelming and I wouldn't really know where to start. Um, Whereas in those systems where they're run more by the publisher, it's kind of like, all right, well, here's this uniform format that works for anything that you are watching. Once you're kind of familiar with that, you're good to go. 
Yeah, I, I think um, for sure, and uh, he's going to love this, but I've got a friend that I've talked about this kind of thing with quite a lot, right? Um, and he watches like a lot of uh, F1, um, has suggested right. that as a, a, a an interesting kind of system that still has multiple organizers and, and whatnot getting involved. Maybe that, you know, is something that CS could like benefit from for as an example, right? Because there is certainly, um, you just look at rankings, for example. I personally would take the HLTV rankings to be, um, you know, the the uh, primary ones, but ESL's got their own uh, ranking format that differs. The CSPPA's right. got their own ranking format. Um, no one really knows how the HLTV one Is this for teams works. Or players? You know, yeah, for for teams, for teams, for, for teams. sure. Um, I mean, they they, I guess every year HLTV comes out with their top twenty. I, I suppose, right. uh, which again is not quite, but it's a bit easier to figure out with bear statistics plus, uh, you know, trophies that they, they won this year, that kind of thing. But when it comes to teams, uh, they're generally updated like monthly or I guess in ESL's case after they've had uh, uh, an event that they've run. Um, and it can be a little bit hard to to follow because CS has, you know, this beauty of, of simplicity really when you watch the game, right? But if you want to get... Yes deeply involved in uh, all the nuances and maybe watch some lower down yeah. teams but then how do they uh, uh, move up well really it's kind of like they just have to beat everyone else it's not like they get into a position of uh, you know 20th in the world and suddenly you're gonna be invited to the next blast event right maybe yeah. there's a few spots for qualifiers but if you're not um you know, in their eyes deemed good enough or partnered, because I know there's a few teams starting to, you know, it's all very, very uh, difficult to kind of follow and get involved in and um, become like a, a hardcore fan beyond, I think, the top level for sure. Like it can be a little easier in that sense. But even then, not every team is going to be at every event, right? Astralis uh, uh, in 2019 was a little weird from them because they were top in the world. They just went to Blast events. One of their uh, uh, like uh, executive suite, I think, was also heavily involved with Blast. So they kind of kept their, you know, artificially kept their ranking high by only taking part in Blast events for six to eight months or whatever it was. And that was a very, very, you know, frowned upon kind of thing that they're not being more open with the rest of the circuit <laughs> so and bringing political. in, you know, more. Well, it, it's 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 a little crazy, like how it all. Just like in Siege, if I wanna if I wanna know who the best team in Europe is, I can I can just look to see who's winning the European League. And hmm. then and then I mean we just had the, the EU League finals in January. It's like, well, all right, I'll go see who won that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It it definitely is uh such a weird one to follow, like as an outsider. I can I can feel that. But again, like I say, the game itself, you know what I mean? Uh, and it's very, very core. Incredibly it's just simple, click head, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's very simple concept. It's, uh, it's not all that complicated. Um, either way, I want to move forwards into talking a bit more about um, you as a commentator and some of the you know thought process that goes into that, some of the mechanics of that maybe. Um, and one thing that I did touch on slightly earlier, but I, I would say um, as someone you know who, who has watched your work, see you on socials, that kind of thing, um, it's clear that you have a very strong work ethic. And I think that, We've also made that clear in in the interview. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you you make a lot of notes. Um, you watch yes. like all all the leagues involved. You make content outside of stuff. Maybe if you've got you know a break in between uh, uh, the leagues and whatnot, you stream from time to time, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask: Do you have any kind of fear of of burnout? And maybe is there a way that you try and avoid that? Um. So I never did have a fear of burnout. And I think that uh, how I've approached work in 2019 compared to 2020 have been uh, really quite different. In 2019, it was like just high octane all the time, never taking breaks. I just was like, just that was it. Just going, going, going. In 2020, you know, obviously I got um, the EUL job. So I'm, I have had a year contract on a tier one league so like that was kind of guaranteed um but it also meant that you know how major what i was casting was a, a, a lot bigger and it was more intense and stuff like that um and one of the big things i learned in 2020 was to 
not be how I was in 2019 and not just mindlessly be constantly working. And I did start 2020 like that for sure, but I learned in the process of doing what I was doing that that just wasn't the answer, that I was gonna burn myself out really quickly. And I experienced burnout a couple of times this year, absolutely. And, you know, I've always been the sort of person who like, if I'm not doing something productive, I feel wrong. Um, but I kind of had to be quite strict on myself this past year and, and be like, you need some time to not be productive. But for me, that didn't just mean not like making a ton of notes or, or not streaming or whatever. It was like there were big periods of time where I wouldn't even play video games. Um, and I wouldn't uh, really be consuming esports content and stuff like that. Because for me, I just had to be very strict on myself and, and say like, um, if you are not feeling it, don't do it. Like a lot of people put pressure, especially on talent, to kind of always be showing how dedicated they are to the game. And I think mm. it is important to have that because, you know, you see uh, people in, in esports who, um, you know, very occasionally you come across people who are kind of, they, they take a job for a check. Um, and... I came to Siege very much because I wanted to be in Siege and I love the game and I really love making content for it and um, I love trying to, to, you know, work harder. But especially with everything that happened in 2020 and stuff with the pandemic, which doesn't help, um, I found that for me to be actually doing my job um, at a level that, that was conducive to my growth and, and improvement and success, um, I had to be quite strict on myself about when to be taking breaks and yeah that was quite kind of hard to get used to at first because i had always associated overwork like working myself into the ground um with like being enough or like the, the, knowing that i was i was on the right track and so suddenly changing that for me it was like i stopped doing the thing that i associated with success um so it was kind of weird but yeah i absolutely experienced some burnout and and it's not that i get worried about burnout but i would say that now i'm a lot more equipped to predict it to kind of know if i'm on the path that's gonna get me there um and it can be you know stressful sometimes because you see your peers like streaming making content doing whatever and sometimes you sit there and you're like i should be doing that but when you know that you're exhausted and you know that you need time to focus on other things uh you kind of have to listen to that and one of the big things is you know when i was um trying to make it in esports and i was uh not just you know like i am now where i'm like on one league and i it's a consistent thing before then so back in kind of 2019 um I kind of forewent a lot of my hobbies and interests and stuff like that because I just dedicated all my time to this. And in 2020, I kind of looped back around and relearned the value of having external interests and hobbies and stuff like that very very much so and it's something i'm really grateful to have realized it's not something i regret i don't look back on 2019 and say wow i wish i'd done it differently because at the end of the day it got me to where i wanted to be um but i can definitely tell that my attitude towards work is infinitely healthier now than it was back then the grind mentality isn't it it's very uh kind of yeah. popular at the moment um particularly within the esports space to be fair and and i think working hard uh being productive all the time there's there's certainly you know time well, for the it nature of a freelance industry like right, when, right. when when the majority of the jobs that you're going for are freelance and they are contract based and it's not a salaried position where you um are, you know have a long term guarantee that you have that job of course because if you slow down there's going to be people who are looking at the same jobs who aren't slowing down and that's why that's why I think I learned a lot of this after I got a long term contract mm. yeah i i can definitely see that and i think you know part of the reason that i uh kick this channel off for example um is to try and you know bring something else to the table and and mm. increase the skill set and um indeed interview content for example is something that i enjoy something that's really popular within cs is is uh analysis content there's a lot of um 
commentators, analysts, and just general people in the space who have big followings. Uh, I recently put out like a, a power ranking thing ahead of a, a league that I'm involved in. Um, it's even just like soft analysis. It's like my general kind of opinions, not breaking down a demo or whatever. And it's my best mm. video so far. You know what I mean? Like immediately on Reddit and it just yeah. uh, flies, right? So um, I think that getting involved and trying to push yourself ahead it is kind of maybe sometimes if you um put too much into that a, a trap a bit of a pitfall that you can you can end up suffering um if you're not careful and you know that that burnout i think is a is a serious thing especially at the moment with the way the world is right and all we really have to do is be productive i can't class like going and seeing friends or whatever as being sort of a a, a day that i've done something with um so working on yourself working on you know content or whatever it may be watching vod reviews as as talent right is uh yeah. pretty much all you have to do i guess yeah and i mean you know back in in 2019 when i was really in that you know i i totally had moments where i would like I don't know, like break down and cry because I was so stressed and I was like, oh, this is this isn't going the way I want it to, and this isn't going the way I want it to, and I want to do this and blah 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 blah, and not knowing if like what you're doing is enough and and stuff like that, and it, it's totally a stressful place to be. It's it's not fun. Um, the thing is, like, I would feel like a huge hypocrite to be like people shouldn't do that, and the the truth of the matter is is in the system that we're in you kind of should and that's not me encouraging the grime mentality because i think it's an unhealthy mentality but um you do have to find ways of setting yourself apart and i think there are smart ways of doing that you know if you if you're just streaming every day and you're just streaming the game um you're just one streamer of many uh but if you are doing something like you're saying you're doing this interview content and stuff that's probably not something that everyone else is doing so that it's kind of different which actually is why i used to stream a lot way back when then i took loads of time off of streaming and i came back to streaming after i got the job i currently have and the thing is the reason people wanted to come and watch is because they were familiar with me because of the job that i have whereas if i'd have made that my primary focus prior to that i would have had like you know i don't know 40 viewers and it would have been like fun i would have enjoyed it but it, it, it wouldn't have set me apart because just streaming is not particularly different from anything so it there is that kind of part of it that's like you know they always say work smarter not harder um you have to know why you're doing the things that you're doing and i think i sort of mentioned it earlier but i think that is kind of why things sort of worked out for me i mean like i can't put it down solely to that and that would be blowing my own horn up a little bit but um i think that that at least having a strong understanding of why you are working on something um will help guide you to the right things to work on and that's a much better way of approaching it than just spending all your time doing work just all the time um and yeah i am so grateful that i got to a point where i changed my attitude and my approach and just my lifestyle based around that stuff because it's unsustainable um yeah and I'd and just kind of yeah you just sort of crash into the ground you don't really get anywhere from it yeah i i think there's certainly like a, a healthy balance right sometimes people can as you say focusing on um you know a, a sort of what can i get out of this kind of thing but maybe don't make that the primary thing that you're looking at right or or the like biggest part you know of of what you're doing yeah. i think still you certainly do this and you enjoy it like that should yeah. always be the predominant reason <laughs> like always and it, this is one of the things is um you know i mean i've been working professionally in esports since like january february 2019 yeah. um but for most of 2019 it was it was quite like mercenary jobs so i would get lots of different things whereas obviously in 2020 it was just one um, consistent thing uh which is where i wanted to be that was what i wanted um and when i got to that point and i had this this consistent job there was kind of something in my head that was like right reason number one why you shouldn't beat yourself up about about taking time and, and indulging in other things for your 
um, whatever, regardless of the fact that, you know, this is your dream job and and you genuinely enjoy it and you really want to be here, blah, 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 blah. But you're at a point now where you are doing this every single day for work. This is your job. And I mean, I as I say, I've been working in it professionally for a, over a year at that point, but not in the same way. And so when I was at this point and it was like, this is your job, it, it is not unreasonable for you to need time away from your job, regardless of how much you love it. And for me to kind of just accept that and be like, no, I'm right, that's true, was like, was a really big thing. It's like, at the end of the day, I love esports, I love my job, but it is my job. And regardless of what that is, you have to have time apart from that. Yeah, and I mean, look, I don't want to go like all woe is me kind of thing, but certainly I think um, there are people as well, you know, in the industry or parts of the industry, not necessarily like specific people that, that can kind of exploit that idea of talking about video games for a living is cool, right? Um, and and I think, again, there's been kind of uh, top talent. I seem to remember like Machine at one point came out um, in, in CS, you know, and and just made a like quick little tweet kind of thing um about wanting to move away from that sort of mentality because it affects and um it can sometimes allow certain you know bodies and parts of whether it's like rates or whether it's um the idea of burnout or or whatever it may be that you know moving into talking about video games is 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 very cool guys you know but so is acting or making them or anything that you feel you know you're kind of like passionate about um but still has the stresses and uh, uh, the hardships of yeah. of any kind of uh, vocation, really. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I th I think there's there's a lot there though. Um, I don't know. I, I I deal with stress very very well. So this whole kind of idea of uh, uh, burnout for me, and you know, need, feeling the need to be uh, super productive. Um, I have not been as affected by that. But then you talk, you know, it, it's obviously yeah. like different people, isn't it? You talk about imposter syndrome. That's something I've had quite a bit of. So like um, right, yeah. finding your feet and finding different ways and, and different challenges, I suppose, uh, changes from person to person. I mean, like, I've always been someone who... And this is like, it's so bad. And I, I acknowledge, I recognize this in university. I thrive under stress, but... I am at my unhealthiest when I'm stressed. So I am someone who, if I'm stressed, um, like I eat really badly, I I don't sleep much or, or I'll sleep too much or whatever. Like my actual life is very unhealthy when I'm stressed. And when, you know, when you're in university and it's like you're in exam crunch time or whatever, like that's fine to deal with for like a month or two. It's not fun, but if it gets you through, it gets you through. But when it comes to your full time job that you do every day, you can't you just can't live a life like that. You just can't. Um, and it's it's not it's not nice to be stressed all the time. I don't I love my job. I don't want it to be tainted by me being stressed all the time. So it's my responsibility to ensure that I am not. And that goes for any job. You just mentioned you get hardships in any vocation. Um, and and that was the thing. And the way I saw it when I was trying to get to the point that I'm at now was, oh, well, I'm not there yet. So I'm I'm going to put myself through this until I am because I don't want to let my foot off the gas. Um, and when I got there, I was like, right, I actually reached the goal. The goal that I set for myself at the start of my career, I reached that goal. I can take more responsibility over my health now. And that was really important, like both for mental and physical health. Um, so, you know, and, and when various things pile up, whether it's things happening in your personal life or if a global pandemic hits everyone, um, you get piled on stress. And so your ability to thrive under stress, if, if you're, you know, like me, um, does diminish the more that there is. And as with everyone in 2020, I was totally hit with a slew of personal shit um, that, that I was also dealing with that became really quite hard. And, and, it, and I wasn't thriving under stress. Um, so, you know, the other thing is I have to be very careful because <laughs> I'm epileptic. If I get too stressed, then that is that I have definitely had like seizures from stress before. So <laughs> I do have to be careful from that perspective as well. Um, but it's not it's not healthy to 
have this idea that on a long-term scale, you're willing to put yourself through that because like once you get there, you won't be, you just won't. You'll hit, you'll hit a wall where you realize you can't do that anymore. Um, so you do have to be more economical about, about how you approach it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, going back to that kind of grind mentality, another part of it is like, if you go through enough difficulty, somehow you'll you'll get your reward kind of thing. And that's not necessarily how it works. It's like, it almost feels like it's so masochistic, but it's like, it almost feels better when you get the reward to like, look down and see the blood on your hands when you're like taking it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I yeah. worked for this and I can see, I can see what I put myself through to achieve it. And we really glorify that. Um, and I've seen people talk about this, this online and it's not something I've thought really deeply into because like, I am totally uh guilty of the same feeling like i can't turn around and be like oh it's terrible that we glorify this and i can't believe people do that because i do it as well i totally look at myself and, I, and i'm like i put myself through all this shit but at least i got this out of it and i earned it do you know what i mean like it's a, a horrifically masochistically good feeling <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean terrible yeah yeah definitely uh again like over time right it's not gonna be good for you but I can see again it's something that just like for me I've I've not really um thought about you know and 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 uh, been attracted to as an idea I suppose right um and maybe yeah. in places like I I should be I don't know I don't know really that that kind of drive and that um ethic definitely comes from you know I I think finding the motivation um sometimes is a is a bit of a struggle for me but then it's more so I think now I'm trying to get into the mindset of like, you know, just general discipline because motivation tends yeah. to come in uh, uh, spurts, I guess. It's one of, that's one of the, the, uh, the biggest pieces of advice you can ever give anyone is when, when people say like, how do I stay motivated? It's like, well, you, you can't. Motivation mm -hmm. comes, it ebbs and flows. Like what you need is discipline. Absolutely. That's like, it's one of the biggest things to, to learn. And it's something that I've definitely been shit at in the past. <laughs> maintaining yeah but yeah. i don't know when you're a fan of games right you know you can certainly have a, a a good week of just sitting doing nothing i don't know new wow expansion for me right dropped and i had a good few <laughs> days of just doing nothing at all to be yeah. honest not ashamed yeah. to admit it um <laughs> but i wanted to move into a little bit more kind of uh the mechanics around commentary right and 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 the the job that you do on rainbow six um very simply, what are some of the things, and I suppose maybe you could draw parallels or differences from, from Overwatch, but what are some of the things that you found challenging with Rainbow Six when you first moved into it? So the fact that I still had a lot to learn about the game notwithstanding, talking solely about like the mechanics of casting, um, the biggest difference between Siege and, and Overwatch is Overwatch as a casting flow, um, or, or just as the flow of the game, is fight based. So you, you basically have one long map, and within that you have a number of fights between each is some downtime. Whereas Siege, kind of like CS, is round based. So you kind of have the downtime at the start of the round, um, and then it builds up and up and up to a crescendo at the end. Um, so that is, just straight up a different kind of momentum um to work with and the style that overwatch has it's that very moba-esque style so you'd see the same in something like league of legends or dota that very moba-esque style has a lot of nuance in how you f you tie together the the downtime and the fights and how they're connected because um the downtime itself is very important in what is going to happen in the next fight so for example, in Overwatch, you have like alt economy as one of the biggest concepts um, competitively. And when that downtime is can really affect how that works. You can predict who's going to win the next fight before the fight's even started purely based on when one team decided to uh, retreat because of the alt economy that they're trying to build and, and what they're trying to do with that. So 
it's very like forward thinking you kind of think like that whereas in C just like you have this three minute span of time and you can be forward thinking you can turn around and say like oh um you know this is where they're placing these gadgets this is the the operator lineup that they've brought this is the bomb site that they're going to so uh this is probably the style of play that they're going to go for but the actual fight itself probably isn't going to be five on five um by that point you would have lost a couple of players and uh, it will be more splintered, i.e. there will be different parts happening in different areas of the map for different reasons, and it lasts a short amount of time, and I'm talking about like potentially a few seconds. Um, so that in and of itself is quite different. The other thing is Siege has a more hybrid style of casting than Overwatch does. Overwatch, um, Again, like MOBAs, uh, very, very defined boundary between the color and the play-by-play, -play. Um, whereas in Siege, um, it's much less so. So you do have a color and a play-by-play, -play, but both casters have to be able to do both. Um, you could argue that Siege is 60% color casting, like, or at least both casters have to be able to do 60% color casting, at least. Uh, and the play-by-play -play stuff might not last very long. It could last a, a while. It really depends on how the round goes. Um, but Siege is a very, very analytical, tactical game. And so both casters have to be able to talk about the analytics and the tactics that, that are going on. And I wasn't really used to a hybrid style. So for me, as someone who had never play-by-play -play casted... Um, even though I came into Siege as a color caster, I switched to play by play for a while. Um, I, I came in as a color caster. I had to learn on the job how to manage the play by play part of Siege, even though it, it is it is smaller than the color part. And and the thing is, you know, as a color caster, your predominant job, other than like actually analyzing what's happening, but but from a, a more kind of subtle perspective, is to set up your play by play. And so that means a lot of energy management. You have to understand what's going on so that you know how to manage the energy and set up the energy that they'll be coming in at, but also taking it off them and bringing it down to the energy level that it should be at. And that's something I worked really hard on in Overwatch to get good at. And in Siege, like the way that the energy management is, is different. Like the distribution of the energy in a round is different to what it is in Overwatch. So I had to kind of relearn that and the pacing and the momentum of that. Um, and then, of course, when I moved to be doing some play-by-play -play in Siege, that just blew my mind because I was used to being the person setting up the play-by-play -play and, and being the, the caster too. So not the leader, I was the follower. Um, and, and now suddenly I'm the one who's meant to be leading that stuff and I'm just like, the, that was just a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> like, that was a real learning curve. Um, but yeah, a lot of the pacing and energy distribution, I think, is a, a, a real big difference that I noticed between the two games. Mm. Yeah, I, I think for sure. I've watched like a few games of, of both, a little bit more uh, Rainbow Six, but you can, you can certainly feel just kind of even from a very basic kind of perspective. Um, when it comes to, you know, you talk about the, the play-by-play stuff, uh, how much focus do you kind of you know put on that when uh i suppose because again like i've talked about you make a, a lot of notes and it definitely seems that the more analytical side of things um is a, is a primary focus but how much like practice would you say you put on the the play-by-play well, I mean, my practice was pretty much all on the job because when, so I did play-by-play -play for stage two of the EUL um, and for stage two, we were casting five days a week. So, um, you know, I valued my weekends <laughs> and there wasn't really time outside of that to, to be going away and, and practicing. So practice was on the job. Um, and I would, I mean, the biggest thing is like, you have to ensure you have a really good line of communication with your duo so that you're both on the same page. And one of the benefits to casting from home, you know, as most casters would agree, it's so much nicer to cast in a studio, but one of the benefits of casting from home is you can type feedback to each other as you're casting. You can't do that in a studio. <laughs> so um, we would be talking to each other like during a game about you know what we thought we needed to change or what was going well or or kind of you know hyping each other up or whatever um but i try to you know as you kind of mentioned before i watched 
other regions that I didn't cast. And so um, I would kind of be listening out to, to hear how they would do it and, and try and make mental notes of uh, things that I either wanted to try or should just bear in mind for the next time that I casted the, to try and implement. Um, and that would, uh, that would really be um, kind of a big part of, of how I, I went about that. Um, but because like siege casting is kind of unique or at least siege play by play is kind of unique it wasn't like i could kind of go to you know friends of mine that i knew in overwatch who play by plays and be like yo so what's your opinion on this because it's an entirely different style of casting um and i you know i spoke to a, a couple of my friends in siege who do play by play and stuff like that but i mostly took it into my own hands because i i still wanted to develop my own style around it and and figure out what i was doing and and as with any type of casting, it you know the the more you are learning about the game, the more you're playing the game, stuff like that, you're always going to improve. Even if you think you know loads about the game, um, you know you're always going to improve by by stuff like that. So that's really kind of how I went about it. It wasn't like I sat and had like a, a training camp, <laughs> uh, like once a week where I would I would do reps or drills or whatever. Um, it was really like right, this is something I'm learning as I'm going. Yeah, I, I think for sure when you already have a, a solid foundation as well, right, of of the game, and I guess that's something to uh, fall back on in a sense if maybe indeed, you know, you feel you have to. Um, but I, I would say a lot of my, like, because I focus primarily on, on play-by-play anyway, and I mean, you know, you talk about, like, the hybrid style, a lot of CS, um, unless you're super, super in tune with uh, uh, your, your duo partner, a lot of CS that I do, I guess, is is uh, hybrid as well. Um, but I would say kind of like, unless I feel there's something really drastic that I need to work on, um, the crutches is always one for me. The, you know, the uh, repeating phrases seems <laughs> once, once per broadcast is always something that sticks, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, like a lot of it is done on, on the job, um, as you say, I suppose. Um, would you ever maybe like transition to the desk is that so i think this is something that you've definitely been asked before but like as as a solid analyst is that something that interests you um i mean if it were like oh you know there's an event coming up like do you want to be on the desk i'd be like yeah sure but for me i've always been very very uh firm that that i want to stay in casting like in EUL, we kind of hybrided it where all of us who were casting did desk work as well. We didn't have a separation between desk and um, and casters. So we were all rotating. And it was really cool to get the opportunity because it was something I hadn't done before. And um, it was kind of nice to break things up and, and whatever. But um, I wouldn't want to just do desk. Um, that's never been something I've been particularly interested in. Like I'm just... There's something about like the energy and the showmanship of casting that has always suited me much better. And I think my general demeanor and my voice and um, just the way that I am in front of a camera like suits casting much better. And it's just always been what I've I've really, really enjoyed way more. Um, so no, I've never never been interested in, in just being a, a desk analyst. So I don't think that would really be for me. Yeah. I I think that's fair. I I don't know. Like, it it seems uh, a lot of people maybe try and force that parallel a little bit, sort of thing. And um, sometimes it goes the other way as well, right? Starting to see a few people in uh, CS that are say like your ex pros that become desk analysts after the fact. Mm -hmm. Some of them are now transitioning into you know color commentary and and whatnot. And I yeah. I don't think again it's like a parallel that people try and just force and it's they're two very 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 different jobs really um for sure so one thing i wanted to ask is when when you're in game right or well mm -hmm. watching a game right yeah. um what is something that you keenly focus on to to make a point on you know a, a certain area of the game that you find kind of interesting or a nuance that you like to bring light to more often than not um I try to focus on where gadgets are being placed because not just because it's important, 
Uh, but for me, as someone who who came into Siege with still quite a lot to learn, uh, for me to focus on that, I think is important for my own learning and improvement um, because it forces me to think about why is that there? You know, why have they made this decision? Why, you know? Um, the ones that come the most naturally to me are uh, operator lineups. So like which operators have been picked and um positioning and the reasons those are the two that come most naturally to me is because those are the two big ones that i would also talk about in overwatch um so that way of thinking and and those kind of considerations are ones that um i've had the most experience in and know a lot about and i mean there were other things that i focused on in overwatch that just simply aren't relevant for siege um so for me like it, it is the most natural to take note of why is someone where they are and why would these two or three or four or five or whatever um operators be picked in conjunction with one another and as a direct result what do the opposing team have or not have that is going to be affected by those choices so i try to focus a lot at least in my head and, and think about why things are being placed where they are but the ones that come the most naturally to me that i don't have to think as much about are definitely surrounding like operator choices and positioning yeah i think they're definitely like key things as well again as a bit more of an outsider it does seem like um those operator choices especially can can dictate a lot of the way i guess that you're going to be approaching um yeah. the the particular map or game or um structure of it that that kind of thing uh again it's something i i guess maybe like uh in a subtle way like weapon choices in cs but i don't think there's yeah like it's a, like a loadouts in, in in something like cs or call of duty where you do, well black ops 4 was different Mm. uh but yeah, in something like like most cs or, or call of duty where like you're not playing a character with a set loadout it would be about like the custom loadout whether that's the weapon or what i i mean i don't know how it is in cs i know you have your economy where you buy different weapons but i don't know if you buy like side weapons or whatever yeah um and i mentioned black ops 4 because obviously they had characters with set loadouts in black ops 4 which i really liked mm. um i mean that's that it is a consistent thing in games that i like in terms of esports it's like overwatch had the same thing siege has the same thing black ops 4 had the same thing like i like that um having like the total freedom to just have whatever you want to me is less interesting um but yeah i'd say that's probably the closest parallel mm yeah I, I suppose it's kind of like again just ultimately the game's decision making in a sense uh maybe your economic choices right because you do different things in in cs with that whether you want to force buy spend all your money on a on a weaker buy or save or go somewhere in between that kind of thing mm -hmm. um so but uh, again i feel two very very different games and, and rainbow six for me is uh, uh an interesting one and I suppose at, at my kind of level, I have played the game, to be fair. I have like a few hundred hours in the game, but like mm -hmm. on a super competitive uh, uh, level or watching it, I've, I've not really been there. Did try when uh, Prem, to be fair, I, I sent a little casting thing off when that first started with, with Des, I believe. Um, it was terrible mm -hmm. on my part. <laughs> um to be honest because i just sort of you know thought having a couple hundred hours in the game that i'll give it a go it should be okay um quite a big learning experience for me actually very early on in cs career anyway that just sort of you know it's not that easy to to transition from from game to game um, no no you have to do a lot of prep yeah because it's not even just about knowing enough about the game but it, it's it's yeah. it's showing that uh you you genuinely like kind of give a crap about being there and there have certainly been instances where that's not the case you know like certain uh big especially big name talent might be offered jobs on other games because of their reach and their success and and whatever but um you know i'm not a celebrity in the esports world so so when i have wanted to change in the past it's like well i i already know i'm i really like the game and the community but i have to make a space for myself here while also learning um at least the very base level 
of um, of what I need to know in order to actually do the job. Because I, I mean, I've never been someone who's doubted my ability to learn and I definitely learn fastest on the job. So for me coming to Siege, it was like, I just need to know the absolute basics so that I can get through a cast and show that I have the ability to cast. And then I will worry about the intricacies of what I need to know because I can build on those. And I know that I'll be able to do it because I didn't know what. Yeah, I don't know. Would you say like uh, age and kind of maturity as well helps with that sort of mindset? Because I, I feel, you know, um, I was 19, I want to say, I think when, when I did it, like casting my mind back, um, which is a dangerous kind of age, at least for me, because <laughs> I thought I knew everything, but in, in reality, you know, finally I'm past 18, <laughs> I'm at university, but in reality, you, you still kind of know nothing. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, having a mature outlook helps, I suppose. Having a mature outlook definitely helps because it helps you make good decisions and it helps you make intelligent decisions. Uh, but I don't think it necessarily affects your potential um, at all. I mean, you can be a great caster um, and and know a ton about the game and be really young, but whether that's going to translate into how good your conduct is or because, you know, it's not very common in esports to get formal social media training. So if you are kind of young, like it's usually the young people that you see like make fuck ups on social media as well or not really be able to manage themselves very well. Because again, freelance industry, there's so, you know, you're very kind of on your own in that sense. Um, and of course there is there is like the nature of um, being taken seriously by people who are older than you i that's not something i feel like i ever had to deal with but um i'm sure that is an issue for some people um i mean i was what 21 when i started yeah i was 21 i think um was i 21 maybe i was 22 i don't remember uh yeah, I must have been 22. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so not quite as young. You know, I was out of university, you know, and, and I was young, but not not young enough that people still would have seen me as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's it's less about like that having an effect on how well you can literally do the job in the moment. People don't realize how much being a commentator or just any kind of personality in esports, but being a commentator... Uh, how much of it is like the iceberg below the surface it's not like what you do on the broadcast is a very small portion of your job um and it's all of the other stuff that being young could have a negative effect on for sure for sure as to be honest as uh my mum says i don't know where she got it from but everything up to 25 is practice um I, well i'm I 25 this really year like so that. well you know i think you've got things in order you're doing okay for yourself for sure on, on the rainbow so. six side of things um but look i think that's going to do us we've uh broken the hour mark uh really want to thank you for coming on you interview very well and uh i hope you've enjoyed i have it's been it's been good fun and there you have it a stellar interview coming in from Gio. i think i uh, summed it up pretty well at the end really really enjoyable great guest to have on um, and a lot to say, of course, you know, I, I really hope as per usual that you guys enjoyed it. You found something kind of informative there. If you're from that CS crowd, once again, maybe you can draw some parallels between and some differences, of course, across the two titles. And uh, I suppose the three in a little bit, we touched on Overwatch ever so slightly as well. Um, but very important conversation, like I said at the top of the show about burnout um, really do think that you know there's there's a lot there to learn from um, just because as I said I think Geo has worked so incredibly hard and, and um, sometimes uh, self-admittedly it feels a bit weird to uh, take time off you know and to give full respect to that time off but um, yeah a hell of a lot of fun once again huge thanks to her for coming on um, very very quick and easy to work with love that that's going to do it for this one, though, folks. Of course, you know the drill by now. Make sure you drop a like, drop a sub, leave a comment. You know, Let me know who you want to see next. Maybe do I stick with endemic CS people, people that I know a bit better, so to say? Um, or uh, do I continue to venture out and we just make it a more broadly esports-based interview show? 
don't know, don't know. Time will tell. My next guest, I've already got it recorded. Uh, my next guest is indeed a CS content creator. And then I probably have someone who is also from CS coming on after that. So uh, be sure to stick around for those. But as always, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate your support and I will see you in the next one.